Welcome to another edition of Computer Train. In today's show, we're going to pick up some topics from last time where we were talking about keeping your computer up and running and keeping it safe. And I'm going to take some time to address some issues. And just this week, some people came and asked me questions about different things. And I thought there would be some good examples for today's show. So hop on board and tune in for another episode of Computer Train. It's time for Computer Train, the weekly TV program that trains you how to use your computer. With your host, El Paso Community College faculty member, Russ Myers. All right, let's start today's show with something pretty simple. I was working with somebody the other day and I was looking for their taskbar and of course I was looking at the bottom of the screen and they actually had their taskbar to the side of the screen and it made me think had I ever talked about that on computer train. On my personal computer I also have it off to the side and I've done many many shows on computer train related to the operating system. Uh, as I do in my intro classes I've told you how important it is to learn as much as you can about the operating system and that will make you a better computer user. Uh, so this is something so simple, I think I maybe have uh, overlooked it. So I want to show you that today. First of all, let's review what the taskbar is. The taskbar is the bar that runs usually on the bottom of the screen. And what the taskbar is showing, obviously, uh, because of its name, it's showing what task the computer is working on at any given moment. Uh, it's also a place where we can easily switch applications if we need to. Uh, but it can be put on the left, top, or uh, right part of your screen. Uh, my, my personal preference is I also have it on the left. I also want to show you something else about the taskbar. So a couple of real quick things before we really get started. Um, the taskbar can be hidden. Uh, it's called auto hiding. If your mouse is not on the taskbar, the, uh, the taskbar will not show at all. When you move your mouse down to the taskbar, it'll pop back up. Very easy to change. What we're going to do is we're going to point to the taskbar with our mouse. And then we're going to right click to get pop-up menus. Remember a lot of the options on a computer we can acquire through pop-up menus. And we're going to go to the properties of the taskbar. Okay, and one of the things that you can do here that many people do is this check mark right here. This is auto hide the taskbar. If I put a check mark there and I am away from the taskbar, it'll automatically shut itself off. So I'll just show you that real quickly. I'll put a check mark there. Click OK. All right, and I'll move my mouse away from the taskbar. So now if you look at the bottom of the screen, just like we were a second ago, the taskbar is not showing. If I move my mouse down towards it, it's going to pop back up. OK? Um, in day-to-day -day uses with my mouse and moving it around the screen, it starts to pop up and go down, pop up and go down. And to me, it's kind of annoying. Uh, so I don't use the auto hide feature. All right, the other thing we can do is we can actually move the position of the taskbar. You can see there's another option in there. Okay, so right now it's set to the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to set it to my preference, which is on the left side. Okay, takes a little bit of getting used to because especially if you've been using the computer day to day, and you've been used to looking at it at the bottom of the screen, you know like the clock and the date are on the bottom right. So if you look at there frequently, now the clock is actually on the bottom of the taskbar, which is the bottom left. So now our taskbar is vertical. Okay, so here's our start button on the top left as opposed to the bottom left. And then our notification tray, our date and everything, that's actually going to be at the very bottom down here. Okay, so it might take a while to get used to. I kind of like it because now I'm in a full screen for the application again. Uh, the tools are over there on the left side and then my actual work is in the middle. And then when I need to see something, my eyes are going straight across. They're not going up, down, up, down. Try it out on the left, maybe the top, maybe the right, and see if that preference is a little bit better for you. All right, another example I have, uh, a person had a file with a list of names and the names were together, last name, comma space, first name, in one cell in an Excel file. And what they needed to do is they needed to break those names up into separate cells. Uh, I had covered this in many shows ago related to Microsoft Excel, but I thought it would be a great time to review it because it's such a fantastic tool in Excel. So let me bring that file up and explain what we need to do here. All right, so they were sent this file, and they have people's names here in one cell. But for their purposes, they need the last name and first name individualized. So with a concept in Excel called flash fill, 
what you do is you start typing what you want it to look like. Excel detects the pattern that you're doing and it brings down a menu indicating that it'll do the rest of them. There are actually about 250 names here and I'm actually going to get them all done in a couple of seconds. One thing to remember if you use flash fill you must be in the column next to the text you're fixing. You can't just be from any column to any columns because it looks right next to the cell. So if we want to zoom in here a little bit I'll show you what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be typing the people's last names. Okay, so I'm going to type the first one. Now I'm going to start typing the second one. If you use this feature, don't type too quickly because the minute the menu comes up, you have to accept it. If you keep typing, much like autocomplete, the menu will go away. So now I'll start typing the next one. And that's what I want to see. You can see the menu is down now with all the names. So now to get all 250 names, I just press enter. Okay, so now I'll do the first name since it's only taking me a couple of seconds. Type the first name. Type the second first name. Once again, there's the menu again. Press enter. So I just got about 250 last names, 250 first names from names that were put together in a couple of seconds. I'm also going to show you, you can go the other way. Let's say I got a file of the names individualized and I want the opposite example, I want to put the names together in a format. Very simple to do that, so I'll do that in the next column. Type the first person's name, I'm going to put last name first, comma space first name, Then I'm going to start typing the second one. There it is, it already detects that I want last name, comma space first name, and all I have to do is press enter. Flash fill is a fantastic feature when you have a column information that you're going to generate from another column or cell of information. Instead of building formulas like we used to in the past, flash fill fits the bill. One last word of warning is this is not a formula. If you go back and you change your original data or you put a new set of data in, you have to rebuild the flash fill. It will not automatically update itself. Okay, one last example here. In this example, this actually affected me personally. Here is a list uh, that they send out the coordinators. I, not only do I teach here at the community college, but I'm also a coordinator of my information technology discipline. So what the uh, college does is send out files to the coordinators with all of the faculty names in that division. Uh, and it has contact information. So if a instructor calls me and say they can't make it that day, there was an emergency, I have a doctor's appointment, what I can do is I can go to my list and I can start contacting people who I might be able to get to sub for their classes. The problem with the list they sent me is they put multiple pieces of information in the same column. When you do that, you have uh, destroyed the way we can sort. So let me show you the problem with this file. Here is the list of names. I don't know if we want to zoom in just a little bit because we're after this first character right there. They've put in some kind of character in the beginning of the person's name. It's not an asterisk that I can tell. Uh, but because that character is in the beginning, I can no longer sort by the instructor name alphabetically. Uh, most people are aware of sorting with letters A to Z, uh, numbers from 0 to 9. But what many people don't understand is the computer does have a sort order for every single symbol on your keyboard. Okay, so now by putting that symbol up front, they've destroyed the sort order that I can do for the name. At least they could have put it at the very end. So what I need to do in order to make this uh, a good example, I mean a good list that I can sort, is I need to get rid of that uh, asterisk symbol. Also, they have done this list in Microsoft Word tables. Nothing wrong with Word tables, but when you have a large amount of data like this, lots of people, lots of rows, you want to do that in Excel. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up this table and drop it into Excel. Uh, one of the things we've done in the past is work with tables in Word. Let's just review how to select it all. On your table in the upper left, you're going to get a little square right there. If I click that button, it will select the entire table. So I'm going to do a copy and paste procedure. Step one, I need to select what I want to copy. Step two, I'm going to initiate the copy command. You can use the ribbon, the shortcut key I've described in the past, which is control C, uh, or you can use pop-up menus. I'll go ahead and go to the ribbon and click copy. Now I'm going to go to a Microsoft Excel file. I'm going to get a blank one. 
All right, and what we want to do here is we're going to paste this information, so I'm going to paste that in there. All right, so first of all, this is where it should have been done originally. I'll go ahead and size the columns just so we can see it a little bit better. All right, so now I have it pretty much the way I want, except I still can't do the sorting because of this asterisk. In previous shows, I've shown you how to do a search and replace. Uh, most times when we do that, in fact, the example that I used in the other show was you search for text and you replace it with other text. This is kind of an odd example because I'm searching for a character. Uh, this character is not really one from the keyboard. It's from uh, the symbols. So what I'm going to do to make sure I get the right character is I'm going to edit this cell and I'm going to copy that character and then I'm going to paste that character into my search and replace because I have to get this exact character or I won't find it properly. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. I'm going to copy it. Now I'm going to select the column where I want to do the changes. And I'm going to get to that search and replace dialog box. Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel and including PowerPoint, you can get to it with Control H. So I'm going to do a Control H and I'm going to paste that character. It won't quite look like that character in this dialog box, but that is the correct character. In the replace with text box, I'm not going to put anything. Because I don't want to replace it with anything, I'm essentially telling it to find it and delete it. So if you don't replace it with anything, it's actually like a delete. So I'm going to go ahead and click on replace all. Okay, so that character was in my file 71 times. I definitely want to, don't want to go one name at a time and delete it. All right, so now, if you kind of look closely, I wanted to show you this. Because of the character they used, look at what my names look like. And that's because this is a Wingdings font, which is not a normal font for text. So I need to change it to a normal text font like Times New Roman or something of that nature. So we'll do that. So now I have my names without the asterisk, and now I can sort them. Oh, we have one that has a space up here. Let's get rid of that and resort them. All right, so now I have, I have sorted them by instructor name, and they're all the way from A to Z. Okay, so much easier for me to use it now. Before, all the people that had that asterisk were at the very top, and then everybody else was down below. One tip, if you're making Microsoft Word tables of information, that's fine. If it's large amounts of information, do not use Microsoft Word tables. Do it in Excel. It's not that hard. Excel is nothing more than a table. The second tip that I've discussed is don't put multiple pieces of information in the same cell. If that asterisk means something, make a separate column and put in the entry for what that means. All right, so now we're going to pick up some uh, examples from the previous show where we were discussing keeping your computer safe and make sure it's running properly. All right, we're going to start off talking about trying to do some things to prevent viruses from entering your computer. Uh, now that we're connected to the Internet, I uh, explained in the last show how many devices now are connected to the Internet. We're talking about billions uh, of devices now and more devices every day getting connected to the Internet. Uh, we want to make sure we employ some strategies to keep our computer safe. So let's talk about a little bit about uh, virus prevention. Okay, so the first thing is, as I was discussing in the last show, we need some antivirus software. And the one that I was showing you in the last show was Windows Defender. Okay, I'm not trying to uh, promote any particular virus protection. I'm trying to promote that you have virus protection to keep your computer safe. Windows Defender is nice because it's written by Microsoft, uh, which wrote the operating system. The other great thing about it is the version is free. Lots of companies provide free versions. Usually you have to buy a little bit higher version if you want additional uh, options and facilities to it. But get some type of virus protection. And as we discussed in the last show, make sure that it's up to date. So we're going to talk about that again. Okay, so as I said, most virus protection does come with a free version. Okay, here's a biggie, and this one happens to a lot of people. Um, email is one of the top ways that we get viruses on our computer. 
Uh, again, related to the operating system, we talked about there's two different kinds of files, uh, major categories of files. One are system files. System files are essentially the files that contain the instructions that our computer executes to get it to do what it does. So when you click on the printer in an application to print your resume or if I wanted to print that list that I just did, it is a system file that's taking care of that. So the system files are necessary. But what we need to understand is people can write system files that have bad things uh, about them. Also, because of applications like uh, Excel and Access that where you can build macros, which are predefined instructions that are built into the application. So unless you are positive of the source of that particular attachment, you don't want to open it at all. And then if you do, again, the virus protection that we talked about will help you. But be very wary of attachments from emails. All right, this is a very important one. We want to set virus software to automatically perform regular scans. Uh, in the previous show, we talked about making sure Windows, the, the operating system, is up to date. We go to the Action Center where we go to those options and we can set Windows to update automatically. That way we don't have to remember and run it. You want to do the same thing with your virus protection. Uh, in your virus protection, if your computer is on and you set it to regularly scan your computer, so if it starts at 4 in the morning, it will scan all the files on your computer making sure that there were no viruses found. Um, I have mine set to do one a day. It's not during the day while I'm working. Usually it's set you know, at midnight or some hour like that, and it'll run automatically. It's a great feature to make sure we stay up and running. Okay, this is again related to the um, attachments. Set virus software to scan all incoming email. Uh, again, there's various ways that viruses can come in through email. The number one is through attachments. There's also embedded types of codes within the email. So our virus protection essentially is we want to take a look at anything that's entering our computer. All right, this is what I was talking about related to Windows. Make sure your, si uh, your software is up to date. We talked about in the last show about the Action Center. Uh, essentially, new viruses are, are created every day. Your virus protection essentially has like a uh, dictionary of viruses that it's aware of. If a new virus comes out that your virus protection software is not aware of, you won't be protected. So essentially when you do updates on your virus protection software, you're just increasing that dictionary of viruses it's aware of. Uh, there's even conspiracy theorists saying that the virus protection companies sometimes write viruses so that they can combat it and you have to buy new software. I can't comment on that. Okay, and this is a biggie. Uh, I've discussed this particular topic on many, many shows for many, many different reasons. Uh, we're creating all of these important files. A lot of you now are using your cell phone to take pictures and videos, and you have uh, all of these very, very important files. We can't have those files in just one location in case anything happens. Oftentimes, at the end of my classes, I try to go up and down the rows and see if anybody forgot their flash drive. So if they have, then I take them and make sure I give them back to the, the next time. But before I give them back, I always ask them one question. I say, are the files on this flash drive backed up somewhere, on your hard drive at home, on your laptop somewhere? And usually the answer is no. So I ask them, well, if you lose these files, what happens? Uh, if you've been doing your English report or you wrote your resume, you'd have to recreate it all over again. Don't do that. Make sure you back up your files uh, at least on a semi-frequent basis, and then I usually determine on the importance of the file. For instance, my grade file in Excel, if I change the grade of one student for one assignment, I back that file up, because that one grade may have a determination of a grade between a C or a B or a B or an A. So once again, back up those files to another location so that you can keep them safe. All right, another thing we want to do here is we're going to take a look at how Internet Explorer can take a look at a website and see if it's a safe, uh, a safe website. What happens through all this Internet surfing is sometimes you're redirected. So you think you're going to a good site, but you're not. Uh, so I wouldn't use this all the time, but if you're going to like a banking website or a purchasing website, you can have Internet Explorer check it out. And here's just a sample screen of what it will do. 
it will g put this in red and tell you that it's found an unsafe website. And then it'll give you a little bit of information not to proceed to that website. It's very easy to do. So let's jump over to Internet Explorer for a second. And I have the college's website up on the screen, but I just want to show you where to go to check that. Uh, each of the web browsers will have some kind of option like this. I'm uh, demonstrating Internet Explorer at this moment, but if you use Google Chrome or Fox Pro or if you use the Apple version, um, Firefox or something like that, just find out where it is. So on the address bar in Internet Explorer, all the way to the right. So we're going to go up here to the upper right corner. Kind of hard to see, but we have this little cog right there. That's the Tools button in Internet Explorer. So I'm going to click on the Tools button. And down here we have a Safety option. Then in Safety, you have a very quick little option here, Check This Website. So we'll see if our college website is a good website. All right, so if we look, it brings up a message here. And it says, the smart screen filter checked this website and did not report any threats. Now make sure you look at that note. It says, even though this hasn't been reported as a threat. So in order for a particular website to be listed into this, again, it's a dictionary uh, type activity. In order for it to be listed, someone had to have reported it or Microsoft had to have become aware somehow that a particular website is a threat. So just because it's not in the list is not 100% fail-proof, but you're pretty sure that this is a good website. And you can see how easy it was to check. It's a one-click check. Another activity that happens a lot with everyone, including me, is we download files from the Internet. My students, uh, I have them go to several websites, usually publisher websites. In order to do their homework or their projects, they have to download files. And a lot of times they get confused about where it downloaded. Uh, one of the tips that I've given you in the previous show is when you download a file in, in Internet Explorer, you have a save or a save as. And usually most people just click the save button. If you click the save button, it will save it to your computer in the default location, which is the drive and folder structure. If you do save as, you can pinpoint exactly where it saves it. But if you get confused, there's a very easy way to check it, and that's to view your downloads. Once again, I'm going to go to the Tools button. Very handy little uh, option here in Internet Explorer. And we're going to go down and look at View Downloads. This is where we have downloaded a file from the Internet. Okay, so before today's show, I downloaded a couple of files. So my dialog box is going to tell me that. So if you hover your mouse over this location item, it will give you the full path of where that was downloaded. So the first one I downloaded to a particular location on my flash drive. So if I hover over there for a second, it will give me a little screen tip. And this screen tip tells me the exact path. I actually saved this to my flash drive into a particular folder. The second one, I did what some of my students do. I just clicked the Save button without paying attention to where it's saved. You can still go get that file. So if you hover over this one, this is the default one. So you can see this one downloaded to a folder called Downloads, which is on the hard drive. So if you make note of that location, you can still go copy and paste it, or uh, you could re-download it. So really nice place to go see where the downloads are. And I've used this against my kids once in a while. I'll say, well, who downloaded this such and such file? And they go, we don't know what you're talking about. We didn't do it. So then I will open up this dialog box, and I will point, and I'll say, somebody downloaded this file. Uh, so I know a lot of information about the computer to watch their uh, browsing habits. All right, last one related to Internet Explorer, and that's about pop-ups. Pop-ups are, based upon their name, they're little windows that pop up with information. Uh, those get very annoying, and Internet Explorer can help handle those. One thing I do want to show you, however, is some websites that you go to, if your pop-ups are not turned on for that website, it will, you won't be able to use the website. And that was the one like I was just referring to with my uh, students. There's a website we go to where it's got to have pop-ups in order to open the file that they're going to be working on. So we have to allow pop-ups for that site. And I want to show you how easy it is to do that. So on our Tools button, one last time with the Tools button, very useful little option here again. We're going to come down here to Internet Options, right there. 
in that dialog box, we're going to go to privacy, which is the third tab over. Okay, so first of all, this is where you set the pop-up blocker to be on. Okay, and you definitely want to have that turned on. So my pop-up blocker is turned on. But I'm also now going to go to settings, and I'll show you where we can put in a particular website that we want to allow to have pop-ups. Okay, so you see in this dialog box, this is where we would put a particular website. Okay, so uh, my banking website, when I do certain things, I also need that one. So I would put in that website. Okay, type in the address and click the Add button. So now if we look at this list, we have two websites in the list. If I go to either one of those websites, essentially the pop-up blocker will allow the pop-ups that are required to interact with those websites. So I hope in today's show you enjoyed some of the tips that I gave you continuing that thread of discussion about keeping your computer up and running and safe. If our computer goes down, what's the use of all the shows that I've shown you of how many great things you can use it? And I hope you enjoyed a couple of those tips where if we get files and certain things that we have the skills to modify them for our use. So I'll see you next time on another edition of Computer Train. Mm -hmm.